Um, hi, all together. Today we are going to continue breaking down object detection and uh, the application in um, different tasks and directions of different detectors. So go through the uh, main metrics, namely the mean average precision, precision recall plots, and uh, things that have to do with dealing with unnecessary bounding boxes. It's kind of like a short summary of today's uh, lecture. So uh, yeah, let's let's, let's get uh, let's get going. Uh, first things first, uh, let's uh, just quickly recap what uh, object detection is. Um, for most of you, uh, probably unfamiliar with all the details. So I'm just going to quickly remind it's uh, the task in computer vision that uh, tries to localize objects in certain. Um, frames of videos or just simply images um, and uh, tries to actually even outline the bounding box of the object as precisely as possible. So it assigns uh, a class or a label for instance like a human or a bike or an apple or anything else uh, to like objects in the image. And uh, basically it just uh, also supposedly gives you like the model that you're using uh, an object detector is uh, has some certain area of confidence in each bounding box that describes each image uh, it's not always the case sometimes they're like omitted sometimes like built in the system but usually uh, usually the, the bounding boxes can have a certain threshold like 80 percent confidence uh, probability that uh, this is actually the relevant object. The higher the probability, of course, the better. The more certainty we have that we um, outline the correct class. And um, there is a whole wide range spectrum of models, architectures, and um, approaches that allow us to do so, namely like perform the task of object detection. Um, so if we go back ever so slightly in the history and uh, like the developmental node of detectors, you can clearly see uh, that uh, things started to kick off in the early uh, 2000s, namely with uh, things like hog detectors and DPMs um, that used handcrafted feature extractors and um, there was nothing automatically calculated no convolutional neural networks, not, no features were extracted like in a more uh, automated uh, pipeline way, kind of. And uh, on top of that, like once you extracted the features with uh, manual feature extractors, there was a uh, final part of the, of the architecture, so to say, which was called the bounding box regression task. So once you have like potential areas of interest, uh, then you kind of have to um, let your model know and kind of uh, compare what model predicts the original uh, bounding box of the model of, of the output. Uh, perhaps it's uh, it's near the, our desired object. For instance, we have like a cat image and we have a cat, but the bounding box is slightly too big, and it's not ideal. Uh, and the ground truth or the original label, like the classical label that was given as an input, like a Y. Um, or uh, something we're trying to predict or to detect in this case is actually uh, slightly uh, smaller and you need to kind of regress uh, the box uh, ever so slightly to the right or to the middle and maybe towards lower left or something and just to align it to the original ground truth. This is how these uh, networks were uh, originally um, not networks but uh, models were originally um, designed, the, these ones, the traditional detection methods. Uh, and then there was a huge revolution, of course. You probably are most uh, most times now familiar with AlexNet and with ILS, um, IL, ILRCVC, the ImageNet competition as it's in itself, and uh, that the first deep neural net uh, that won the competition and outperformed all these traditional detection methods, not detection, to traditional feature extractors uh, with the convolutional net, CNN, in 2012. And since then, uh, people start to, to kind of pile up on the idea of convolutional neural networks being used as a core um, feature extractor in object detection algorithms. 
and here comes the era of like deep learning based uh, detection models and uh, of course this was all this was all credited to a huge like surge in uh, computational power increase of course thanks to many GPUs uh, more modern more powerful ones being developed partially thanks to video games I guess maybe uh, this is kind of very much inspired the uh, heavy compute heavy computations uh, like and uh, calculations inside these CNNs to train them to actually make them robust and uh, not like overfit or underfit at all so basically there's this uh, the, the branching here there's in this side there's a branching obviously uh, one stage detectors and two stage detectors do separate um, ideological approaches to detect something uh, on the image the one stage detectors long story short those uh, usually are state of the art right now better than two stage they only do one pass across the image uh, and um, they don't like, go back or go into depth they do one path and um, they extract enough information for a prox for pretty decent anchor based uh, <coughs> bounding box regression so these, these architectures obviously th this, this this is something that's uh, state of the art even now YOLO YOLO was uh, one of the greatest uh, discoveries back in, back in the days and then like, its variants, its uh, improvements YOLO v3, YOLO v4, YOLO v5 v5 is one of the best now even though it's kind of outdated there's YOLO v6 recent and even YOLO v7 those are kind of tricky but they show very good results and benchmarks and uh, YOLO just uh, this is the acronym for you only look once uh, which is a single, uh, <coughs> single stage or one stage uh, detector that uh, makes use of uh, different convolutional and kind of dense blocks as well as pooling blocks and different pyramidal designs uh, and in the end kind of regresses the bounding boxes in the anchor anchor fashion uh, we'll talk about anchors and details closely as a bit later but generally this is kind of the state of the art branch so SSD, yeah, single 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 shot detector, RetinaNet, uh, kind of um, something that uh, makes you use and capitalizes on the um, pyramidal structure of the architecture. Kind of this the layout reminds us of pyramid. Um, yeah, it's um, it has good capabilities. These uh, detectors have very good capabilities in finding objects in even high resolution pictures or very low resolution pictures or frames and have they have like a hard negative mining meaning that they address um, hard negatives pretty well and on the contrary and kind of, kind of on the other hand on the other side of the branch we have the two stage detectors uh, from the name it's uh, uh, understandable that they have like not a singular like path on the image uh, but maybe um, one path like the one that one stage detectors do something something additional, and those usually um, like if we go back in the start of this line the, in branching, there's RCNN, a uh, very classic uh, approach and architecture that was used to um, detect objects like parallel to before like before YOLO even emerged, and uh, the concept was first it just extracts features with CNNs, was which was good. Uh, kind of like an improvement over the traditional methods and then, then uh, once the features were extracted uh, there was a separate um, there's a separate module called region proposal network this region proposal network uh, it uh, tried to generate kind of like uh, overlap the existing feature maps like the ones extracted by CNN the CNN backbone they overlap this uh, uh, these like uh, regions of interest arrow highs and um, once those were sufficient enough, they passed them like in the final stage where they assigned uh, anchor boxes, anchor box centers, and uh, regressed the anchor, the bounding boxes according to like ground truth. This was uh, working quite well, good performance, uh, like quite decent uh, metrics they received back then. But this was very slow, very, um, very not sturdy at all. And kind of massive because it required too much time to compute like gradients and anchor calculations and kind of like those arrow eye pulling 
or region of interest, like pulling step, it was not suited for well, it was not like, suitable for uh, inference at all, for production, for deployment, and that's why our CNNs, um, faster CNNs, faster CNNs. This is just kind of like how this architecture evolves. Uh, and then even masker CNNs, those uh, didn't perform as well, were not as popular as YOLO and uh, and the family here about. And there's also obviously the SPPNet, some different architectures like uh, pyramidal networks in the end, but those kind of, they follow the similar uh, concept, similar fashion. Of course they were able to extract um, uh, features uh, in a more uh, environment dynamic way, like to fuse features better and kind of extract things uh, Probably with more precision, but uh, they did um, also like uh, of course uh, they were based on anchor, anchor centered system of object detection and they had like, multi reference uh, detection as well. Uh, but this this all came with a big cost of uh, speed and opt uh, optimization. This was just uh, absolutely terrible uh, in terms of like uh, real world applications. So this is where it's where it was left kind of uh, back in the day. It was kind of a big, big important slide to um, recap and understand the main differences of uh, between the one stage and two stage detectors and uh, kind of how they work. So let's move forward. Uh, yeah, there are multiple data sets used for evaluating such tasks, like classical ones, like Pascal block, uh, with different objects uh, and bounding boxes. Of course, there is of course ILS VRC. Kind of like something based on ImageNet. Uh, I don't know. I don't quite remember how many classes are there, but still, uh, there is a certain amount of okay, a bit, like nearly one thousand like in ImageNet, and um, each of these data sets. Yeah, I'll finish with the data sets first. Uh, there's MS Coco. These are both objects and masks. So here, uh, there is there is no RCN mask RCN here, but like this this small uh, like development, RCNN fast and faster RCNN, these are like only the beginning, somewhere over here, somewhere in the year of 20, almost 2017, 2017 and a half, there was a model, and still is a model, uh, called mask RCNN, which not, not only does perform object detection, like, like here, not only like finds these boxes, but it also um, performs instance segmentation, uh, namely retrieving each of each single pixel of each object and kind of like outlining the mask here, like like in this picture, like with this uh, with these uh, people on scooters or this dog line on the bed, and there's like a TV controller and something else, maybe some some other TV controller. So this is this is called like instant segmentation. So Moscow CNN did both both like detect these this style of bounding boxes as well as um, the masks of the image of the objects in the image. And this is pretty cool, but. Uh, uh, yeah, this this data set, MS Calco, this basically um, has both masks and uh, bunny boxes and like true labels. But uh, usually it's mostly used to evaluate instant segmentation models. In general, it's just segmentation models. Open images, yeah, another data set with like different, very versatile and like um, absolutely uh, diversified set of images with different situations in everyday life. Uh, lots of boxes here. I don't know what's going on, but it looks very kind of something that needs non-maximum suppression, <laughs> uh, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about NMS later. Non-maximum suppression. This, damn, this is so overcrowded. Yeah. Uh, so the data sets are kind of it's pretty clear. All, they all have different formats uh, of one, one, one little sentence. They have different formats on their. Uh, bounty box description. So some of the data sets like um, MS Coco, uh, they have uh, the ideological like uh, standard of writing like lower left uh, bounty box point, the upper right bounty box point, and the center point, uh, and that's it. Sometimes they like they have different formats. Maybe like in YOLO format, they write uh, center point width and height. Or something like that, and uh, it might, might get messy, especially if you are used to one data set and then you like traverse to another data set, uh, and you just try to write a script that loads the images. You might like load an image, uh, everything is working, but apparently the bounding box like skewed somewhere 
is not where it's supposed to be just because uh, the coordinates uh, are flipped or something else went wrong so you have to be careful if you're like uh, if your research concerns or if your like project and your work and like your assignment concerns object detection you have to be careful with the data set format um, that's, that's kind of it uh, yeah before we go into metrics are there any questions uh, regarding the previous slides anything unclear anything you want to ask no suppose then mm, let's move let's move let's move towards the metrics if you ever have any questions uh, I very much encourage you to just interrupt me I do not see your hands uh, maybe yeah no I, I could do that but that's not gonna be convenient uh, so please do not uh, yeah, feel free to interrupt me whenever you uh, feel like it so metrics uh, main metric for um, object detection task is uh, average precision or um, something that kind of uh, describes how many of the potential objects of interest were found and how many of them were classified correctly. So this is somewhat of a precision, somewhat uh, also kind of like recall uh, is involved here, although uh, clearly there is no word recall in this, in, this, in this metric formulation, but still this can be used, uh, this is usually used with some kind of like uh, Incepted concept of recall. Um, so AP uh, or average precision is defined as the average detection precision under different recalls. So um, suppose we have recall of one, like the best recall possible. How much of a precision are we gonna get there? And then there is a recall of 0 0.8. So we miss two correct objects from 10 on average. And how much of a precision do we gonna, are we gonna get there, like this one, or this spot rather? Excuse me. Or suppose we have a terrible recall, like uh, 0 0.4 this section. How much of a precision are we gonna get then? So of course, the precision and the precision and recall trade-off is uh, very intuitive. So um, to better understand that, uh, let's do this precision recall. Precision recall wiki. Uh, this is an important concept in all data science and machine learning. So uh, here we can clearly see that uh, there are two important statistical concepts uh, in play here. Uh, the type 1 error or false negatives and type 2 error. Oh, sorry, that, that was wrong. It's type 1 error uh, or false positives. Type 2 error, false negatives. Uh, false positives revolve around uh, precision. So um, basically, uh, they are added to the total pool of uh, our objects of interest, like here in the bottom. Hopefully, I can zoom this in. Uh, yeah, so they're added in the bottom here. So this this red part, false positives, is something that we failed to uh, kind of reject. We thought this was a correct uh, object, but in fact it isn't. Uh, type 1 error, the most common error, usually it's maximized in some cases. Uh, uh, like the precision, I mean, is maximized in some cases. And uh, false positives are minimized for some, like industrial tasks. For, for others, it's like vice versa. So, um, let's see, let me do this. Let me do a very, very quick uh, paint, paint session. Oh no, I don't think I had that. That was good that weird uh, search so um, so precision and recall uh, good good a good way to memorize this so uh, precision or PR sorry PR is uh, basically it has to do with uh, type 1 error so type 1 uh, I'll just do this also it has to do with uh, um, has to do with uh, false positives or if false positives, uh, false positives. I'll just write like this. And this is like uh, the acronym. Uh, the acronym for it is FP. So FPs are like our worst enemies because we kind of uh, we don't want uh, our system to incorrectly predict uh, certain objects and classify them as correct ones. 
This is pretty 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 bad for most systems that has to do that like they that do computer vision. Uh, so there's also like counter metric or like a uh, in in yang. So this is kind of like yang recall here. Let me do a different color uh, green one for recall. So recall is uh, just uh, R letter capital R. It has to do with a type two error, which I already mentioned. It's kind of like an important statistical concept to realize, and that's it. Uh, it has to do with false negatives. So some, it's just the good understanding, like of the good trick to uh, rememorize and understand what FPs and FNs are. Like has to do with, uh, uh, sorry, this this is too much. FNs, FNs and FPs uh, is that false negatives um, is something that uh, we just our system just misses them completely it doesn't uh, get those uh, objects of interest it doesn't even give precision right it doesn't even give precision a chance to make a mistake so it's more of a global uh, global, prere global prerequisite for our metrics calculation and uh, precision uh, only is calculated upon um, the finalized recall if this if this like uh, part let's suppose like uh, there's a good picture here there's this half of the circle uh, that is like probably good and there is uh, this half of the circle from all the potential choices and if this uh, overlaps this this overlaps and this overlaps we have recall of one and uh, if we have uh, if, if there's like something missing here like in this very like numerator area if then in the denominator there's obviously uh, sometimes it's hard to check in industry case scenario but like in our case it's easy because we have labels so we missed something recalls like 0 0.9 and uh, the precision then is calculated based on this recall uh, so it's not going to be uh, made, like taking into account those 0 0.1 percent uh, like 10 percent of the images we look objects we classify we we fail to detect, but it's just going to uh, start from like something that we just gave to our network. Th these two usually they correlate very much. Like co uh, rever rever they do reversely correlate. So if you try to maximize your precision, uh, there is this like famous plot here of precision recall. Uh, if you try to maximize your precision. A recall is gonna uh, not. It's, uh, I think I think it's supposed to be like this. Uh, this recall. This is precision. Might be mistaken. So if you have a very small recall, the uh, the precision. Oh yeah, it was correct. Uh, I'm just messing messing about. One sec. Precision recall. So we have high precision, we have low recall, and this 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 graph looks something like this, kind of like uh, area under curve for uh, binary classification, for instance, uh, ROC, AUC. But this 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 of oh, there's like uh, there's an elbow here, kind of the elbow of optimality somewhere around these parts where we can find an optimal value for uh, both precision and recall, like somewhere about like ninety percent. Um, there's also a metric called uh, weighted F1 score. F1 score, and it's just uh, it averages the two. They are both involved in calculating the score. Sometimes it's a good metric, but sometimes you just need to maximize. Like, you don't want uh, intruders in your house uh, and have security cameras, so you don't care about uh, you, you don't care about precision. You might, might as well have false positives, like trigger your alarm for your guards to come and like check check on your house. You can pay for that, of course, like this yellow, yellow, yellow arrow. But you do care. What you do care about, though, uh, is recall. For instance, uh, in this scenario, in this scenario, this this R should be maximized because uh, we do care about false negatives. If there is at least one false negative, and we have a burglary system, our company, and like so, some some institution gets robbed, our company has to pay a, a whole lot of money to someone who got robbed. Because uh, like we got a false negative, the system did not detect the intruder correctly, and that's it. And sometimes false positives are important. For instance, when you have uh, 
sometimes when you have like suppose p one error um, it's, it's a bit it's a bit tougher actually I mean examples can be can be uh, easy to come up with but doesn't fit in my mind now but for, for a good example of FPs there is uh, the uh, something to do with medicine or hospitals uh, sometimes uh, usually false negatives are more important here but in some cases it is very um, it is very important to actually handle false uh, like not only fail not fail to detect a disease but also do not fail to incorrectly like avoid incorrectly uh, diagnosing the patient because if you start if you get like some serious uh, disease treatment and this is a completely different disease from what you have this is gonna have like a very dire consequences on the well-being of your patient and you don't want that you have to be careful as well so this is where FPs come into play and you um, you can sacrifice some of the false negatives I guess to some extent. This is more of like a balanced F1 score system, but uh, I hope you get the, the example. So yeah, now let's let's go back to the lecture. Uh, it was a quick, uh, quick drive off. So the AP, um, this is a similar concept. Uh, the less uh, recall you have, the better precision, and vice versa. There are like formulas, multiple formulas, kind of like that. Uh, um, conceptualize this idea and this metric. Uh, the mean average precision usually uh, is like the core and the only like final metric of performance. You have to calculate a P per class, so uh, just average precision, but not take into account any like means or medians or anything. You take each class of your like data set, you calculate average precision with a formula, like a, with, an, with a like calculation of like real numpy, and then you divide uh, this all on the number of total number of classes. So you kind of do this cross class. So make sure each class is pulling enough weight into the final uh, metric contribution formulation. Uh, yeah, let's uh, go on with a metric se section. There is a Jacquard index or intersection over union. Very important uh, like concept to comprehend. This uh, basically uh, comes from lots of uh, like discrete mathematics prerequisites. And uh, basically, what it does, they show here it's on this nice little B picture, picture. Then you have this box, uh, you have the original box. This is a true box, a ground truth. It's a, it's a kite. And then there is uh, our model predicted. Our detector just outputted this this uh, like dashed uh, bounding box. It's decent size. It's like it's capturing the object almost completely, but it's slightly skewed towards upper upper right. And uh, how how do we calculate what is intersection of reunion? Obviously, if you intersect these two, if you get this, up, I mean this this is. Uh, I'll continue in the paint again because uh, this is uh, well illustrated visually. So, uh, so we get first we get the intersection with this red part, uh, the 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 middle ground of this uh, of this kite, of the box that is like a true box, original box, and the box that we generated. This is uh, the intersection, uh, and uh, we have black color here, and there's also a uh, union. And union is just uh, simply two bony boxes bound together. This is this uh, green area. I'm going to make it more simple. Hopefully it's semi-transparent or something. Um, so, no, it doesn't work. Uh, no fill. Solid fill. Let's try this. Well, this is terrible, but it will do. It will do. So, basically this is uh, what unions this. This part Plus, of course, this part. So this whole area of two bounding boxes is uh, just uh, our union. So you divide. I'm oh, sorry. You divide intersection of uh, uh, let's say GT with pred or prediction pred uh, to intersection. Intersection over uh, to union. So you divide over union. GT uh, union pred. 
where GT is just the ground truth and the uh, prediction is what our, what's the output of our model. And this gives us um, how much of an overlap they have. Uh, how much of an overlap they have. And this, uh, this whole concept uh, is just, uh, like this is illustrated as well here. Um, this allows us to understand how much, uh, how close are we to actually the correct goal, to the final original, like, uh, pre pre selected ground truth, as in this guide of this image. And um, usually, this, this not usually like this, this function, the IOU, uh, has values between like uh, it's bounded by it's bounded by zero and one, I suppose. There's of course variants of this function called uh, like some modifications. This is this is IOU. Let me just do this. This is IOU. There is a generalized IOU as well, G IOU, which is something more sophisticated, parameterized IOUs. But usually, like some of the more, more, more like novel things, uh, they deal with one of the issues of this metric. And uh, this the issue is we cannot the IOU so it does exactly the same kind of like. Uh, uh, the same uh, evaluation of the metric, or like of, of the closeness of boxes, despite the the situation that they can be separated in different parts of the image and not even overlap or overlap overlap in a different way. But the IU is going to output the same thing, like zero, like not zero, but closely to zero. So uh, let me see. Let me do this. So yellow, yellow. Let's suppose that this is an image, right? The box and stuff like that. This is the same image. Well, like, let me do this in this corner. Uh, this is the same image, and uh, there's this object and this object, and the IU is going to be the same because they're kind of like of the same scale. This one and this this box. And this is kind of bad. And they, the researchers did, did uh, address the question by uh, creating like a GIU function, I mean the best one that ranges from minus one to one, and the closer to the ground truth, the closer to one. The further from ground truth, the closer to minus one, and the zero is like uh, not overlapping panic, but in a close vicinity. So this is this is an interesting interpretation of the function. Uh, pretty cool. But uh, yeah, let's 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 move on to to the IU itself. So this uh, this metric has a, a range of from zero to one. Usually good ranges are like 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. The closer to one, the better. And of course, uh, the detectors uh, can output for the same object. They can create multiple this, uh, multiple boxes, all having different IOUs. Like there could be different shapes, different sizes, different uh, I don't know uh, distanciation. But usually, there's only one perfect box uh, for each ground truth, or close to perfect. So uh, in order to cut off all the terrible boxes that the model created, or outputted, we have a, a concept of thresholding. So we define a threshold, supposedly 0 0.5, and we say if our intersection of our union of our prediction, predicted blocks and ground truth is less than 0 0.5, then the object is uh, the ground box is discarded. Basically, um, it is not a successful detection, and anything that exceeds 0 0.5 is, is is a valid box, and we consider it uh, for for like the final filtering stage. It's kind of a more advanced, sophisticated, uh, kind of complicated task of object detection. So a uh, lots of metrics and like filtering, post-filtering, pre-processing, -pre post-processing comes into play. Uh, yeah, averaging precision over intersection of the union. Yeah, <laughs> this uh, this researchers um, they start to pay more attention to accuracy with the body box location and they. Try to use less um, IOU and use like AP, kind of with the with the threshold 0 0.5. They have uh, a, like a perfect localization threshold 0, 0 0.95. I don't know much about that, but this is just uh, typical MS Coco stuff and like the benchmark uh, uh, characteristics. I'm not going to dive deep into this. So, any questions so far?
Good. Uh, then let's let's see some examples. Enough of the uh, formulas and stuff, I guess. Let's have a look at this uh, the vehicle and pedestrian detection. So we have this uh, nice little picture here. We have uh, what uh, one vehicle here, two vehicles here. Obviously, there's one like sticking from the back of another one, and there is the there are two here, and there is one here. There's a, there's basically a, there's a big uh, collision and uh, occlusion of uh, of some of the important objects. And that uh, makes the task hard. There's also this, this human guy, only one, right? <laughs> one human guy. Good. So uh, let's see what this uh, what this has to do with uh, our task, namely. Sorry. So this is the uh, input image. This is something that's yeah. There are like five cars. Oh, that's one car. Is it? Doesn't look like one car to me. I think I asked this question a year ago, and this was actually two cars, but never mind. Let's suppose that's one car. So one, two. No, three. I think that's actually two cars. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. that's what I think too. <laughs> so this is a very cool occlusion. So okay, supposedly f for the perspective uh, of this uh, tutorial, we will uh, presume there are five cars here in this image. In this image, there's one, two, three, four, five, and one pedestrian with a light green box. Good. Uh, why does it want to scroll? I'll just do this manually. Uh, yeah, and then we have the detector output. So this what our detection model. Um, how put it? This is kind of uh, weird, I guess, at this first glance. But the human the human guy, one human guy, was correctly, almost correctly predicted. Sort of slightly shifted towards right. Of course, the bunny box. There is some weird other non-human being detected here, but the model thinks it's a human. Uh, let it be. This car, uh, of course, was detected. Was the, more, the frontal uh, object in the image, pretty easy. And this, car, this car was also pretty in a normal fashion. Well, this car was not uh, triggered. This car... Well, see? No, like now, in this in this case, they got this car correctly. Like, But this is then supposedly is also another car. Why didn't they correct this? I mean, the model was probably pretty weak. And there's also a false uh, a false negative here. There's nothing there. There's just uh, uh, trees and that's it in the lane. And there's, there's no car. So let's try to calculate very quickly by hand uh, the precision and recall. So let's start with, uh, with humans <laughs> or almost humans. We have uh, two objects. So precision uh, is going to be uh, what? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, so, if recall uh, is one, that means uh, we captured all possible humans. That's good. That's true because like this, this, this overlaps. This is fine. But the precision is one over two. We captured one too many humans, and that's why uh, sort of uh, this this is not supposed to be a human. The precision is just fifty percent, unfortunately. And then uh, as for vehicles, we have uh, five vehicles. Um, Let's start with uh, with precision. So uh, we have uh, five bounty boxes: one yellow, two uh, yellow, one. I don't know. So two yellows here, two yellows here, and one yellow here. And uh, this is kind of weird, but this is correct. Correct me if I'm wrong. And this one is also correct. Well, this one is missed, so precision is uh, kind of impacted already. That's a minus one out of uh, five, right? So we have two, two out of five and one strike. And then this is also correct, I guess. Is it? I think so. So this is also like three out of five, but we have one strike. And uh, no, 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 no. One, two. One, two. Correct, correct. Correct. I guess this one's also correct, so 3 out of 5, I suppose. And there is 4 out of 5, but this is a strike. This is not correct, this is a false positive. Uh, and there is also this one. Uh, maybe it doesn't... I think it doesn't overlap too much. It has a very small intersection of our union. That's why it was discarded. And uh, it leads us to believe it's three, like 2 mistakes and 3 corrects. The precision is 60%, or 3 out of 5. Uh, we, we can, 
we can assume that, I, I guess. And then there's recall. So how many we managed to capture of all the cars? Uh, there is uh, one car here, a yellow car. Good, we captured it. There's another car here, we captured this one. We failed to capture this one, so it's two out of three. Then there is this car. Uh, I think it's incorrect, so... It's like two out of four now. Yeah, so it's two out of four because there's too much, too small of an overlap. And this car is kind of fine. Not ideal, but it's a correct one. It's a tr tr true positive and uh, counts towards uh, re towards recall. So we have like two mistakes. One mistake is this car. The other mistake is this car apparently, but will not pay attention. So and three correct ones. So it's three out of five. Uh, three out of five recall as well. Um, anyone has any questions on this uh, explanation? Wonderful vehicle and human detection, precision recall. Pretty intuitive, I hope. Um, good. Uh, so this is just uh, the same thing that I just tried to explain, but uh, we have this, these additional slides. Um, I don't think it's too interesting. We don't have that much time. Uh, to, to, to. Yeah, so this is also another kind of something I was talking about in this in the beginning of the lecture of the thresholds or scores, confident, confidence scores. So we have the threshold 25%, and these uh, numbers, these digits, like percentages uh, in near the boxes, they indicate how confident the model is. So here we have like 95% on the car, 87 in the other car in the left, and then those cars are kind of like weak, weakly confident. There's uh, this car. This car is more. Co this is actually a funny thing. <laughs> this is more confident that this is a car than basically this guy. Okay, sure. A human's like 73, and that uh, like uh, that pillar is 27 percent. So this is gonna have the same. Uh, the same. This is like all, all the all the boxes are available. If we cut it down to like if we uh, raise the threshold to 50 percent, we see that uh, lots of objects already like fade. Um, that car faded, that pseudo pedestrian faded, that like the background very confident uh, forest car also faded. And um, yeah, we're going to continue raising and calculating the respective precision and recalls. So here we have, for humans, we have a precision recall of one, that's great. We have exactly one human in the picture and it is classified. No false positives uh, to, ha to hinder. Uh, precision, no false negatives to hinder recall. For vehicles, we have uh, less of an ideal situation, but we do have uh, a very good precision of one. So, out of uh, all the cars that we classified, uh, of, of all the boxes that were left with the cars, all three are actually cars, and those are correct cars, uh, and we have precision like three out of three, right? Uh, but there is a problem with recall, uh, we failed to capture two cars. So we failed to address this car, right, the, the back car from the back of the car, and we failed to address that car, B2, uh, Siamese uh, twins car. Uh, and uh, that's why recall is like uh, hindered. There are two false negatives, and it's 3 out of 5, 60%. Hope that's clear. Um, what is this? Oh, there's some other... If you lower the threshold even more, it detects this guy as a human, uh, this this like road sign as a human. I wonder what this why this detects this this, this sign and not this one. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so we have to be very careful. And actually, see now it actually finds uh, the the rare car with fifteen percent probability, but actually finds it. And we have like uh, different numbers here. With for humans, we have a worse situation for precision because we have one extra false positive, right? For vehicles, we have better recall, and we have like not so bad of a precision. It's like for vehicles, this is an optimum threshold, I guess. Um, yeah, so we have to, for, to tweak and tune uh, the trade-off and like the uh, thresholds and how you calculate the final metric for your model. Um, yeah, what happens uh, when you change the model output? Well, the once again, as I said, uh, if you go if you increase the precision. 
uh, like we are uh, we are increasing the threshold, you drop in uh, recall and vice versa. If you decrease the threshold and recall increase is happening, then like precision is going to drop. And there's this plot, of course, you'll have to probably plot this in your home assignment. Mm, yeah. Yeah, can we propose uh, one numerical value to describe model performance? Uh, well, AP basically is um, sort of different recalls, but uh, um, it does not uh, kind of like integrate the idea of thresholding. So we have there there is a need in explicit uh, like expression of like precision recall dependency in this case. Uh, namely, um, yeah, this is this, why, why are the slides repeating? I don't understand. Uh, yeah, just as a quick summary MAP, you just uh, calculate AP over each class and then divide by the total number of classes. That's it. Uh, the calculation steps well, uh, let's start one by one. Um, so we calculate average precision per class. So for each ground truth, uh, you like compare with the, with, the, with the prediction and uh, see what the score is, the IOU. Then um, yeah, you have the you have to fix the score threshold like 0 0.8, 0.7, and uh, see uh, like discard any boxes that are not fall within this threshold. Then you calculate the similarity between the box and uh, of your model prediction and the ground truth using uh, using IOU like pairwise, so we have nine ground truth boxes and have eleven prediction boxes. So this is just uh, a m by n operations, ninety nine IOU calculations in our case. So it's like a brute force, kind of suboptimal, but uh, maybe you can come up with a different way or find any other different way on the internet to do this faster. Uh, then you are supposed to like uh, match uh, whether the ground truth uh, prediction pair uh, is like yeah, you, you you sort them yeah sorry you you supposed you're supposed to sort them like in a descending way on the confidence level like the most confident at the top uh, and uh, the least confident at the bottom or like least overlap and then uh, you proceed to uh, like take take the top pair and like see if if it's a match or not and then uh, once again. You, the final check is the intersection of reunion score check or uh, post detection thresholding. If your box boxes do not overlap in the the area of overlap intersection of reunion uh, of two boxes uh, is less than zero point five, for instance, it is like uh, probably uh, probably not that good. Maybe something even worse is definitely gonna be discarded, like zero point three. So once you did all the matches, you calculate. Um, three concepts that I mentioned today. The true positives, uh, those are needed for accuracy, false negatives for uh, recall, and false positives for precision. And uh, yeah, this, you, you see the steps here, there's like lot, lots of things to do, but there, there, those, are not that, those are not that difficult. Uh, maybe some, it will take some time for, for you to like uh, get, a, get a hang on the code and like uh, program the, the assignment, but uh, that's uh, so it's not that bad. It's, you don't need to turn in the models here, at least. Um, so you, in the end, uh, calculate uh, the precision like recall. And once you have precision recall, or you mostly are interested in precision, you calculate the average precision, uh, averaging on the classes, and then the mean average uh, precision, just dividing the total AP over n classes. Uh, and this is uh, precision recall tuples. It's just uh, the first number is uh, is in the tuple is just um, precision 0 0.1, very bad, but recall is very good 0 0.99, and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, once again, feel free to interrupt. I'll assume uh, there are none at the moment. Uh, one last thing that I want to talk talk about uh, with you in this lecture is. Uh, also, a very important instrument called non-maximum suppression. Uh, it's um, a vital instrument to further increase the effectiveness of your model, and uh, it suppresses the worst, uh, like redundant bounding boxes that are also 
try to describe the the, the, uh, the object in your the object of interest in the image. It looks like this. So there's this uh, fine little lady here in a black and white picture, and in the left in the picture on the left, you clearly see there are like one, two, three, four uh, bunny boxes, uh, red bunny boxes that try to kind of position on her face, like visage, namely not like the whole head, but just visage. And some of them are doing the better job. So one of them is doing the best job, and some are doing a pretty poor job of describing this, taking too much space or too little space. So uh, what non-maximum suppression or NMS does is just uh, it tries to very simply put, like TLDR, it just compares the uh, intersections between each of these boxes, and of course the ground truth is in play there, and it takes, it selects the bounty box that's the least uh, likely to be like, uh, the most likely to be uh, a good uh, descriptor of, uh, of ground truth, but also uh, if you don't have that ground truth, we uh, take into account the anchor point. There's any anchor point where all these boxes were generated and kind of like uh, the most likely position is going to be defined via the NMS algorithm. So what is non-maximum suppression? Uh, well, um, it's it's like a big set of techniques actually. It's not a singular uh, like approach, but uh, it uh, takes into account that many boxes don't have equal scores in detection, not equal uh, confidences or just overlaps in IOU. And uh, um, it's like a final step after your model inferenced or was like inferenced successfully. You make a post-processing step to remove these uh, like redundant and replicated bounding boxes. To get the final detection result. Uh, basically, um, the NMS for, at, at, in the in the initial times it was not always used and it was bad. Um, but uh, just because of like a lack of uh, vis vision on the task output for the option detection, but like in recent uh, in recent years, uh, it has been developed in three like methods, like greedy selection, bounding box aggregation, and learning to NMS. Basically, those are conceptually different, but they have the same ideological approach to remove extra bounding boxes that are like poor. Uh, this is very detailed. Uh, I'm not going to explain too much on the uh, specifics on each of these algorithms, but the greedy selection um, basically just uh, tries to suboptimal in terms of compute time, but uh, it can it is prone to good like convergence on the f on selection of the needed box, but uh, usually sometimes it can fail. It can be slow sometimes. As well, it's the oldest uh, one of the oldest uh, things. Uh, like, oh, sorry, no, recent things, recent uh, variations. There's body box aggregation, where you kind of have like, like these four body boxes at the top, and uh, you try to like sustain them in the same point and kind of like uh, merge them together. And there's learning to NMS, where it's like it's probably it has something to do with teacher-student curriculum, where uh, there's like a, a whole of different machine learning. Uh, paradigm is used to uh, approximate the ideal bounding box. Yeah, let's see on the slide uh, on the slides. Um, yeah, reselection. Pretty much the key idea is uh, we have the overlapped boxes, and we have the box with the maximum detection score uh, selected from them, uh, from these neighboring ones, uh, uh, and those neighboring ones are removed, like according to overlap that we predefined like 0 0.5. And uh, this is reiterated until all the bounding boxes in the vicinity are gone in a greedy manner and uh, the one remaining in the end is going to be our final box. It's uh, like the staple method in, in the non-maximum suppression, greedy algorithm, but uh, it still has some room for improvement for sure. Uh, yeah, there are some not ideal cases for greedy NMS, for instance, uh, when uh, there was a car supposed to be detected to Lamborghini or Ferrari, sorry, and uh, it just kind of aggregated into uh, the most confident box that this, these are all cars, but the box on the picture B uh, bottom is basically describing multiple objects and that's not good. Maybe some of the other boxes was better. Um, 
the top scoring box may not be the best fit. Uh, same goes for like the plane and but for the train it's kind of like surprising the sort of weird pattern uh, of different boxes that are not even close to being relevant. But anyway, uh, it does not suppress false positives. No, yeah, we can see that. <laughs> uh, so there are of course upsides and downsides to each method. Body box aggregation. The idea is to combine and cluster uh, multiple boxes uh, just into one final mega box. This could be very confident. And uh, it just uh, the upside of this is just uh, we take into account the whole uh, like relationship and the spatial layout uh, of the object to the interactive features uh, in the vicinity. And uh, these uh, like they use VJ detectors uh, for this method only. And this is kind of not, not that popular, honestly. So uh, I guess greedy is, is decent approach, but sometimes can be uh, harmful, but usually it works fine. Learning to NMS, last thing is um, uh, basically we try to, uh, yeah, let's just do this together, right? To rescore all the raw detections and to train the NMS. It's kind of like part of a separate module or a network, like in an end to end fashion. And this is uh, like going deep in the forest, trying to solve a simple problem of uh, NMS with this like elaborate technique. I don't know if this works well, but they have like obviously they say in here they show prom this technique shows promising results uh, on occlusion based uh, like frames and then subject detection. Um, but uh, I don't know, you have to test this, of course. Um, yeah, last but not least, I think we're coming to the end of the lecture and just uh, time to relax ever so slightly to the applications. Uh, there are many applications for object detection and in industry and research and uh, overall like in your in your life even. So, of course, you all know about pedestrian detection or these cameras on the crossroads where cameras count, objects count, people count, uh, cars uh, detect plate numbers, license plate numbers, and um, these use, make use of different detectors for real-time uh, stuff. They used to be, back in the day, like HOG, HOG and ICF, those like handcrafted ones, uh, but then evolved into like faster CNN, YOLO, and stuff like that. Um, so, there are, of course, for each task there is a problem, and there is even a further, bigger challenge that arises. There is a problem of data, the data set. In each data set, there is like an issue. For pedestrians, sometimes they are too small, like less than 30 pixels in height. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's pretty imaginable, but for, for, for your uh, neural network system, it's pretty, pretty terrible, honestly. Uh, hard negatives, yeah, well, mm, some backgrounds. They could be like very similar to pedestrians, or uh, like reminding very closely resembling them. There's occlusions, there's dense concentration of rural areas, no, not non-rural areas uh, in cities, where there's like a lot of people and you can't detect each any one of them separately. And of course, this has to be done real time. This has to have like mobile or edge speed of inference. Uh, because this is crucial for like autonomous driving, video surveillance, security, etc. Um, yeah, and difficult examples, yeah, we can see that some of these are very tricky. Even for a human eye, um, I'm, not even, I'm not even talking about the some uh, rather plain neural networks. That's like with pedestrians. Yeah, okay. Hard negatives. Yeah, there's just those uh, like. Uh, fire, fire extinguishing thingies, thingamajigs, kind of remind the person in, in a costume, like on the car on the carnival or festival. I don't know. It's just, just to my mind. Um, but yeah, let, let's go on. Uh, oh my god, this is still not done with pedestrians. So we can of course improve small pedestrian by using feature fusion, kind of an elaborate concept introduce more high-res pictures and features, uh, more ensembling, more stacking of detections and different resolutions. And to address hard negatives, uh, there is a possibility to um, yeah, use a just 
gradient boosting semantic segmentation to make sure that there's an alternative to GBs. Use it to like uh, outline the background from foreground and different classes and instances and sem semantical relationships between classes. Uh, what is cross model learning? It's just uh, yeah using different uh, channels, not only RGB but also uh, other polarities for the color specter to um, make sure that's not a human being there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, loss function different loss function variations uh, for higher negatives not only for improving the dense and clear pedestrian detection but also for hard negatives it can also be handled by loss functions like focal losses, improved uh, hinge losses and stuff like that uh, it could be also done the former task can be done via uh, ensembling part detectors like not non uh, uh, non whole body human detectors, right? Like only partial human detectors. And of course, that attention mechanism for like visual uh, vision transformer, something that I uh, dedicate a lot of time to researching recently. Uh, basically, discarding any useless information and, gain and solidifying more important information in the image via attention mechanism from transformers, from NLP. Uh, yeah, this, this, there's a lot of room for improvement, kind of. There's a phase detection uh, task, one of the oldest one in computer vision, that's true. Um, yeah, it can be used in many security systems like banks uh, or underground tubes, uh, stores, uh, your, your your phone, anything else that like uh, involves um, facial features being recognized from the video device. Um, but it's a small interclass variation, uh, I mean wide variation, and uh, this can be problematic. There's occlusion, of course, so, so sometimes you can, the object of interest is going to hide his face with the, the palm of his hand, and you're not going to define what the person is. Uh, there's a multi scale detection with different scalings of your face, like far away or up close. A real time detection is also necessary here because it's a vital task to be dealt with immediately or on the fly. Uh, some challenges, yeah, intra-class variation, so same people look as, look alike. I'm not going to even comment on that. There's some occlusions as well, like in picture B. Very weird picture, I don't like it. There's picture C with multiple Indian people, probably, <coughs> from CPR 2017. It's pretty cool, but did it see they don't even come close to detecting all of those faces. And uh, you can speed up uh, the face detection by like, using cascade uh, to methods, you can improve multi pose detection uh, by kind of like referring to 3D pose uh, estimation tasks and like calibrating the face. Uh, occlusions can be dealt with, of course, attention or uh, part based detections. This is the same as for the task here. Uh, but yeah. And you can, of course, uh, retrain on multiple resolutions and multiple feature scale uh, fusions to uh, deal with multi scale phase detection. The improve it, of course, not deal. Text detection, yeah, this is uh, what uh, Dr. Nadia uh, refers to when like, uh, talking about license plates. I think. But, yeah, of course. Detecting text in the image is kind of like OCR technique, optical character recognition. There are many fonts, the different partitions, perspectives, lighting, illumination, occlusion, arranged uh, localization, blurred characters, etc. So many problems here. But yeah, this is kind of like what you do when you ride driving your car and you can like detect things with your, uh, um, I don't know your uh, device that just uh, records the road and then uh, yeah there's a it's a cool task it has quite some applications it's been sort of researched now I don't think it's yet uh, finished uh, like in terms of all potential available applications so yeah we'll see how this plays out uh, these are just, just the examples and uh, the possible solutions well um, Let's go from top to bottom, I guess. Uh, we can. This is just too much. The detectation, kind of like the uh, the variations in the perspective, can be addressed using like 
anchor boxes and ROI pulling. That's like a two-stage attack first year. Um, but you have to introduce additional parameters for these uh, for these parts, these um, modules in the system in the network. Uh, then slate range tags can be addressed by using a segmentation based approach. So instead of just doing state on head on detection, you first segment and then you detect if you need to, and then you perform a CR or something. Um, adjacent text lines uh, distinguishment and uh, segment and linking. Yeah, that's just. Of course, you can, uh, as mentioned here, you can use heat maps and um, uh, just trying to connect to adjust adjacent neighboring segments uh, via uh, like fusing the semantic context of the text of the words in the line. And this can be one way. There's another way to um, introduce like. Uh, these these models were developed and those are kind of like state of the art in some of the tasks, corner and border detectors. Even there's a center net model and centripetal net model, and uh, there's also another one that has to do with like edges uh, and rotations. This does very well in these kind of like tasks where there is um, densely arranged like features in the in the image. For instance, it's gonna not only be used for uh, like text and stuff, but like centripetal net excels at like you have a photo of flock of birds like lots of birds but you kind of like not, not a single object detector is going to detect them properly but you have the centripetal net and this like perfectly outlines them it's kind of like, oh my god how, how, how is it even done but this basically this takes into account the centroids and the distances uh, via the corners how like what is the uh, what is the vector of uh, mm, of motion on of the potential object in the image and it kind of like does a lot of anchor box approximations there and it works very cool um, yeah you can try and synthetic, synthetic samples uh, blah 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 traffic uh, sign traffic light yeah uh, I'll just say that this task uh, is useful extremely useful and vital for self-driving there's uh, of course elimination, bad weather, motion, occlusion, uh, real-time detection, edge, inference speed requirement, lots of potential problems. Uh, these are examples of problems, so we need to make sure that the car knows what's going on, not just sees these weird frames and uh, crashes into someone. Uh, so um, there's also a problem like a task of remote sensing, target detection. This one here is uh, yeah sensing target detection of airplanes ship all but I don't know how, how much of a use this is. It's probably a very like industrialized uh, direction already, uh, like military investigation, disaster rescue, urban traffic management. Uh, but just uh, you're supposed to do uh, like big process, uh, big data fetching and. To scraping and like querying the data set, cleaning it. There's like such huge amount of data for that. Yeah, and uh, lots of targets are included. But what, what's meant here is like these, like satellites and stuff. This can be high res, it can be different uh, potential areas of interest. On the picture you need to outline. And um, yeah, also kind of like pre-classified, so not too much stuff you will see working. I mean, the, a lot of stuff, but not like state of the art stuff, obviously, uh, for, for these things. I did work with this quite closely recently with satellite imagery, uh, military vehicle detection, but uh, it's such a hassle to get the data, it's insane. And even then, train the model, keep everything classified uh, pretty, pretty hard. But still, nonetheless, very interesting task, I think. Um, for someone that finds joy in it, I guess. What's the of the topic? Um, yeah, very nice slide, by the way. Uh, let's see what's, what's suggested here. Yeah, you can keep on the book of uh, Shalinsky, chapter 6.3. Uh, what's this paper? Object detection 20 years of survey. Let me see, I want to look uh, as well. Uh, assignment, yeah, we'll talk about assignment in a second. Okay, so it's a huge paper uh, with different. Yeah, this is where this. This, this diagram was taken from, what is this? Uh, what year is this? 2019 May. Mm -hmm. Alright, so I'll just scroll quickly. This benchmarks. Da, da, da. 
interesting. Yeah, this, this seems like a very legit paper. I encourage you to read it if you want to know more uh, about the object detection. And uh, of course, uh, make sure you read all the 400 alone references and references to those references. Uh, yeah, I'm just joking. Uh, as far as your assignment goes, you will have a short, I guess, practice assignment, a uh, practice period uh, in like 10 minutes. But uh, all you need to do, you have this, there's going to be data set uh, of ground truths, uh, a CSV file, like uh, just a separate, comma separated file with uh, like bounty boxes and images. Not images, but just uh, pure pure GTs and the predictions. So you don't you don't have any data set. You, know, you just have the output of the model and the uh, and the ground truth. You have to calculate MAP. Uh, and personally, last year was like defined. We need to do this by hand. But if you find this any method that you can automate this via existing libraries, sure, go ahead. Just calculate a MAP of this. Uh, of these two of this data set kind of, of this output, then you have to uh, build precision recall graph per class. So you take each class separately. So you can like uh, in pandas you can sort out like and filter out the like in numpy and anything you want. And filter out the data, get one class and build precision recall there. We calculate true positives, true negatives, plot recall precision. That's it. Do this for all the classes. And last but not least, there's a bonus task kind of not a bonus but additional task. Uh, precision recall uh, of thresholded graphs. So you you kind of uh, you do what was uh, depicted in this one in this part. Uh, where was it? This where this was here. Yeah, like like this. So uh, in different recall and different. Uh, so you take like different cutoffs thresholds, and uh, you like do something like this with the, I don't know, ma maximum two three. Different thresholds. Wait, what? What's the what's the orange line? Like it goes all the way down to zero point four precision when it's zero point four recall, and then it goes up. Yeah, yeah, that's. There's, uh, a, um, there's a green this, line and there's a orange. Yeah, this is uh, this is uh, the green one is precision, the orange one is recall. This is. Lovely, isn't it? Um, presumably, precision separate plot. Huh? I, I guess if it, if it was taken from the from that article, we could look that up. <laughs> Is this here? Was this here? Uh, I'm not sure. Could be from Shalinsky. Probably. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, like judging from the picture itself, uh, we have these uh, like recalled thresholds, or like for each 0.1 uh, difference, and those uh, these red dots just indicating how much precision we get in each point. So precision drops when we reach recall 0.4. But I don't know what's this additional lining here, honestly. So recall is 1.4 here, uh, and uh, precision still one. Mm -hmm. But uh, once we move to 0.5, precision suddenly sinks into 0. Point, 0. Point something something 58 or yeah. But clearly, this is not 0. 0.6. This sinks, uh, but maybe this is just for uh, better visual comprehension. I don't know. Like to make sure we see that this is 0 0.4. I, I honestly have no idea. <laughs> I'll give you that. Um, yeah, this this was pretty much it. Uh, yeah, for, for this you just need to kind of like uh, compute sep similar thresholds for your data and uh, plot these graphs for each class, and that's it. Well, not for each class, but just generally for the whole data set. Um, yeah, but we'll, we if if need be, we'll we'll do another period like in. 10-15 minutes, like a quick one, hopefully, just not to take too much time. And uh, yeah, thanks uh, for the lecture. Any questions or uh, queries uh, regarding to any material discussed today? Uh, I only have one thing to add about precision recall. So one cool thing about them is that, 
like you can easily um, maximize precision by just not making a, a lot of predictions, right? So like you can just miss out on a lot of data and precision will be high, but at the same time, recall will be very, very low. And in the same way, if you make like a lot of predictions as in, uh, like if you mark everything as positive, recall will be very high, but precision, precision will, will go down. Yeah, absolutely. So it's like a, mm -hmm. yeah. There's this trade-off. Uh, you kind of, uh, this is very, it comes down to a task you're trying to solve, but usually one of them is more important, but sometimes you need to pay attention to both, like in that medical example I did today, earlier. And then you kind of want to find the, mid, the optimal middle ground for, for both metrics. That's it. Uh, but yeah, you can cheat like that, but uh, if you kind of need uh, precision recall, but this is... Uh, this has to have at least some sustainability, some degree of sustainability. Because if you're going to come to like some industry project and uh, guys are going to ask you to maximize, uh, like minimize false positives, so uh, hence maximize precision, and you're going to do like dump recall, absolutely completely dump recall. Uh, there's going to be no uh, no value in this in this model because, for instance, because the recall is so low, the value of that precision is actually even though it's 100 percent, it's going to be like. 50 times lower than it would have been recall 0 0.6, for instance. This is, see, see, see the drift? This is kind of like this important trade-off. Uh, despite the fact that you kind of get the good numbers, in, in the business value, and in the original task value, you lose a lot. So we have to pay attention to that. Not, not be too tricky. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but what I was trying to say is that like precision and recall by themselves don't really mean that much. Like if you if you consider them together, yeah, yeah, uh, you you really see the, the whole Absolutely. picture. Absolutely, even for that, there is a F one score, a balanced version of the two, uh, for sure. All right. So, any other questions? Uh, if not, then uh, once again, thank you very much for the attendance. Uh, we'll see each other. Let's say in ten in ten minutes and two thirty five p.m. Uh, yeah. Thanks again. Cheers.